Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UCLA Film and Television Archives virtual screening room. My name is KJ Ralph Miller. I'm a film programmer with the Archive, and it is my pleasure to introduce our program this evening, a screening of Please Don't Bury Me Alive, Por Favor, No Me Entier en Vivo from 1976. Today's screening will be preceded by a pre-recorded introduction from Sundance award-winning independent filmmaker, Christina Ibarra, and will be followed by a post-screening discussion with filmmaker Efrain Gutierrez and director of UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center, John Noriega. That discussion will be moderated by Colin Gunkel, Latina, Latino media and art and Latin American cinema historian. This program is presented in partnership with the UCLA Chicano, Research, uh, Chicano Studies Research Center, which was founded in 1969 as the Mexican American Cultural Center with a commitment to foster multidisciplinary research efforts as part of the land grant mission of the University of California. That mission states that University of California research must be in the service of the state and maintain a presence in the local community. We would like to acknowledge that this program is currently being broadcast from occupied Tavangar land in the greater Los Angeles area. As a land grant institution, the Film and Television Archive at UCLA acknowledges the Gabrielino Tongvar peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tavangar. A couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes before we get started here. In the event of a technical difficulty tonight, you can check the email address that you used to register for this program um, when you signed up on Eventbrite, or you can watch our social media. Um, I would suggest going to Twitter for updates on how to continue to view the program. And you can find us on Twitter at UCLA FTV Archive. So this program will be archived here on Vimeo at this same link for repeat viewings and for sharing soon after the end of this program. This link will be active for one week following this evening's program. Please Don't Bury Me Alive, Por Favor, No Me Entier En Vivo is presented in English and Spanish with English subtitles. Captions for today's program, uh, introduction and Q&A will be posted at this same link within the next week. The UCLA Film and Television Archive is looking at options to make real-time closed captioning available for future virtual screening room programs. We appreciate your patience as we work to make that possible. So I would now like to turn it over to two people whose impressive and enormously valuable work in the field of Chicana and Chicano and Latina and Latino film research and scholarship um, really make them the ideal candidates to introduce this film program today and discuss the cinema legacy of Efrain Gutierrez, Chan Noriega, and Colin Gunkel. Chan Noriega has diverse research interests in film and other arts. He is the author of Shot in America, Television, the State, and the Rise of Chicano Cinema, and is the co-author of Phantom Sightings, Art After the Chicano Movement. As director of UCLA's Chicano Studies Research Center, Noriega actively oversees the most extensive Chicano library and archival holdings in the United States, uh, an academic press and ongoing research projects. Colin Gunkel is a historian of Latina, Latino media and art and Latin American cinema. His scholarship in Chicano art involves work on the cultural center, self-help graphics and art, and early punk from East LA. In every case, Colin Gunkel engages archival and primary sources to rethink both historical narratives of Chicano cultural production and the textual analysis thereof. So I wanna welcome both of you and turn it over to Chan Noriega. Well, thank you so much, uh, KJ. It's always a pleasure to work with the UCLA Film and Television Archive. And it is really a very personal uh, pleasure of mine to really be able to see this film come before a, a wider audience through this screening. And I encourage everybody out there, uh, when you see this, let people you know, uh, make them aware that this is available and, and they'll be able to come back here and see it uh, over the next week. I'm gonna just offer some more personal reflections on my experience with uh, recovering this film and working with Efrain for turning it over to Colin and uh, our guest, surprise guest speaker after him. Um, in the 1980s, I was doing a dissertation on Chicano cinema. And I thought this is really simple because there's only uh, 10 films and three of them are missing. 
The three missing were Efrain, by Efrain Gutierrez. They had been written about, we knew they were, they were made in South Texas, they were shown throughout the US, and had actually done well. They had outperformed the Hollywood film in one instance. But they were gone and, and no one could find them. So every time I would go to Texas, I would say, uh, have you seen Efrain Gutierrez? And usually the response would be no, and then somebody would tell me a fantastical story about where he was or what had happened to him. And I'd come back to Texas again, have you seen Efrain Gutierrez? And I'd hear an even more outrageous story. And over the years, I began to wonder whether I really wanted to find Efrain. <laughs> you know? And one day in 1996, after almost a, you know, a decade, I come home and my telephone has a message, and this is when they were recorded on tape, you know, and I press it, and it winds back, and it's, hey, John Noriega, this is Efrain Gutierrez, I hear you're looking for me. And my first thought was, oh my God, he found me. <laughs> and then I realized, no, I'm looking for him. I call him back, and we just had the most amazing discussion. He had actually found the print for the film you're going to see. And uh, he had shown it and said it only broke a few times. And so I called up the head of the film archive and he said, tell him to stop showing the film. You've got to bring that in. And I call him back and I say, we need to bring it in. I'll send you a Federal Express number. He said, no, 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 I'll just meet you. Give me your address. He hops in a car with his entire family, his daughter's best friend who lives across the street, and the best friend's a young child, and they drive to Los Angeles with the film. And they deliver it to the archive. And we were off and running from there. We found the other two films. He was, uh, you know, we, we did forensic archival analysis. He checked with all of his producers. And we were able to bring all three films in. And thanks to the Ford Foundation and other supporters, we were able to restore them. So that's what you'll be watching uh, today. And I'll just end by saying, I got to know Efrain. And when, when he stepped out of that car uh, and, and I met him and his family, you could never imagine two people that were more honor-like uh, face, at face value uh, than Ephraim and, and me. And as we got to know each other, we realized we were very much the same person. And it's been a pleasure getting to know him and this very dynamic and intuitive way he works. He's probably one of the smartest people I've met in terms of assessing a cultural moment, knowing the details that make that moment a moment, and figuring out how to do something that hasn't been done before, like make a feature film and actually bring it to an audience uh, that is starving for images reflecting their culture. Uh, you'll have a chance to uh, hear from us as we discuss and ask questions of him. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm glad you're here watching this film and I, I hope you really enjoy it. I'm turning it over now to Colin, who is a PhD from here and who really worked very closely with the Chicano Studies Research Center on bringing this film forward to the public. Colin, take it away. Thank you so much, John, and thank you, KJ, of the UCLA Film and Television Archive for having me today. I'm just going to say a few words about Please Don't Bury Me Alive and a little bit of the historical context, and we can follow up in the Q&A for anyone that's interested. Um, as the first Chicano feature film, Please Don't Bury Me Alive, is both a landmark and somewhat of an anomaly. Uh, as you'll see, it doesn't look very much like many of the other productions we associate with Chicano cinema during the period. Many of those focused on cultural affirmation, historical reclamation, political mobilization. And by contrast, this film is often gritty, pessimistic, at points unsettling. It was also produced in San Antonio, Texas, distant from the, the cultural and political foment on the West Coast, which is often assumed to be the epicenter of Chicano art and cinema during the period. But in many ways, this film occupies a fascinating crossroads in the history of Latino cinema in the US. And to begin with, Efrain spent some time in Los Angeles in the early 1970s during the height of the Chicano movement. Uh, he was not only impacted and influenced uh, by the Chicano moratorium of 1970 and other events, but he was also involved quite importantly with Nosotros, uh, which was a pioneering media advocacy organization founded by Ricardo Montalban and other Latino actors of a previous generation. Efraim was not only involved in that organization in the early 1970s, but in actors workshops, including the one that would become a training ground for Sesame Street, interestingly enough. He took these experiences with him once he returned to Texas, drawing on generations of media advocacy and activism by Latinos with an eye towards fundamentally altering their positions both behind and in front of the camera. Efrain was also greatly inspired by the example of Luis Valdez, many of you have probably heard of him, uh, and the Teatro Campesino, 
the multimedia arts organization that worked in conjunction with the United Farm Workers Union. Efrain himself would co-found a teatro group in San Antonio when he returned. You can actually see this group performing in Please Don't Bury Me Alive, so keep an eye out for that. And he would also be involved, quite importantly, with the establishment of the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center in San Antonio in 1979, which was among the many cultural organizations to emerge from the Chicano movement. It was precisely this grassroots community-based spirit that informed his filmmaking efforts that relied on family, friends, collaborators, and the broader Mexican-American community of San Antonio, many of them non-actors who appear in the film. The popularity of Mexican cinema among Spanish-speaking audiences in the United States at this moment also shaped the film in some rather surprising ways. Uh, determined to become a filmmaker, Efrain asked to apprentice with Mexican director Rosalito Rodriguez, who was strangely enough making two Mexican films in San Antonio in the early 1970s, one of them a Mexican wrestling film, both of them were cracking down. And indeed, if you look closely enough, you can see Efrain performing as an extra in both Mexican films. But he was discouraged that Rodriguez was not living up to his promise to mentor him. Uh, so Efrain eventually held some camera negatives hostage until he had finally agreed to let Efrain shadow him. Um, and so a filmmaker was born. Um, but it was also the Mexican movie theaters across Texas that eventually became a venue for Please Don't Carry Me Alive, as Efrain toured around the film with them personally from theater to theater. And at these venues, the film was received enthusiastically by audiences that were eager to finally see images of their contemporary reality portrayed on screen. And what did those audiences see? In retrospect, and what you're about to see is a film that in many ways is a document of San Antonio in the 1970s, a rich document, the fashion, the music, the politics, the attitudes, the landscape of the predominantly uh, Mexican-American West Side, and of course, the language. As a person who worked on the initial subtitles for the film, I had to immerse myself in the Tejano sling from that era and grapple with the film whose official language is a specific brand of San Antonio Spanglish with all its humor and fluid code switching. Luckily enough, I had uh, Efrain on speed dial when I just was completely and absolutely stumped. Um, but of course, what emerges most forcefully from the film uh, is a document of a filmmaker and his collaborator struggling against every <clears throat> obstacle imaginable to alter the cinematic representation of Latinos, to document the limited options available to a young Chicano growing up in this environment, to connect these limitations to multiple layers of systematic oppression and to a vision of grassroots film industry on a shoestring budget. Um, it ultimately owes its success and its place in history to the support of a, a community hungry for new visions of themselves. And it is an enduring testament to what a group of determined individuals can do in the face of representational erasure and a lack of opportunity in the industry, issues that are in many ways just as pressing now as they were in 1976. Um, so now I'm pleased to introduce Cristina Ibarra, who in many ways is representative of a new gener generation of Tejano filmmakers and the co-director of The Infiltrators, which is now on demand, available on demand. If you have not seen it, you should. Um, and she will continue this introduction of Please Don't Bury Me Alive. Thank you very much and enjoy the film. I'll see you afterwards. Hi, my name is Cristina Ibarra and I'm a Chicana filmmaker uh, from the U.S.-Mexico border. I've been making films for about 20 years, but back in the 1990s when I was a student at UT Austin, I remember that my learning had to come from outside of the department of radio television film because I was really interested in studying Chicano cinema. Um, I went to Jim Mandiola's uh, programming of Cine Festival back in the 90s, and that's really when I understood just how overlooked we actually were as Chicano film students. My friends and I came across Efrain Gutierrez's work at San Antonio's longest running Chicano Film Festival. My friends and I were trying to make our own Chicano feature film at the time. Learning about Efrain's feature films, how he made them, how he built his audience from scratch, um, how these were not short films, but these were feature films. We had to recognize Efrain Gutierrez as the father of Chicano cinema. It was incredibly motivating and upsetting at the same time because it seemed like there was no interest from scholars or independent film filmmaking mechanisms to recognize alternative filmmaking language like Efrain's that looked at identity and you know discrimination. Seeing this film, Please Don't Bury Me Alive, recently, I asked myself, what does this film offer us today in 2020? How can we recognize the importance and value of counter-narratives like this and of authors like Efrain? 
without condoning the sexism and racism that was prevalent at the time. Please Don't Bury Me Alive asks us to question the morality and colonial practices of our country's legal system. His protagonist, Alex, breaks down the systematic racism that entraps Chicanos in the United States American dream. What does this film say about the need for radical action when our public institutions fail us? What does it offer us in thinking about the hustle to create a Chicano imaginary that is not about assimilation, but creates complex, contradictory, and multi-dimensional portrayals? There are several provocative gestures here that seem problematic today, like the main character's mujeriego ways his womanizing, and his anti-Black sentiments. Yes, there are some elements that are clearly offensive, um, but that shouldn't take away from Efrain's challenge to us to define our identity and our stories in a way that centers us, in a way that um, these films can be made both for us and by us. The outlaw in this film reminds me that sometimes you have to break the rules in order to change the rules. Whether these are unwritten social codes or public laws or cinematic grammar. Anyway, thank you for letting me introduce this important and overlooked cinematic history and the father of Chicano cinema. Hope you enjoy it. Well, welcome to the Q&A session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the film. Please don't bury me alive. I have two brief announcements before we start. I'll be moderating the conversation. I'll also probably be participating in the conversation as well. Uh, but I just had two additional announcements. One, unfortunately, Christina Ibarra is not able to join us this evening for the Q&A session, so we apologize for that. And two, we'll be starting with a conversation between Chon and Efrain, our guest. Um, but please do, if you have questions, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, enter those into Vimeo chat, and you can enter those anytime, and we'll take those um, as they come. Uh, but first, I'd like to, to introduce our, our esteemed guest. You know him from the film, please don't bury, uh, bury me alive, uh, director Efrain Gutierrez. So if this were a theater, there'd be a warm applause uh, greeting you. <laughs> Good to have you with us. Up, uh, and uh, did you say something about the chats? I did, so entering, entering your questions into Vimeo chat. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we should start this. Uh, Efrain, it's, it's, um, that film is, is it's so amazing, and as Colin said at the beginning, it really is distinctive. And can you just say a little bit about how you, uh, what made you do this? Because you were actually working in teatro uh, back in the early 70s, and then, then suddenly you're making a film, right? Well, it was, just uh, algo that, I, not so much that I attracted me to it, but that we saw it happening. And to me, I saw it happening first in California. Uh, my involvement you know, is the need to do a Chicano film. I mean, you, you know, you had seen films and, you know, I grew up, but uh, like Sabina and I, we grew up, like a lot of people, disappointed in how we were portrayed. So that was an issue that was already you know, before I went to California, we grew up seeing, you know, uh, 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 or lack of ourselves on film. But uh, when I went to California, uh, when I, uh, I think my uh, second year or almost third year of, of college, I went to East Los Angeles uh, College. Uh, and that's when I started more or less really feeling the, the movement for the Chicano. Uh, even though the Chicano culture was with us and the Chicano uh, word was already popular in San Antonio, but, you know, I understood Chicano as kind of just uh, a term that identified, to me, kind of the tough guys, you know, the, not the, so much the pachucos, but uh, it was the guys that you kind of respected, like your Chicano. But that's as far as I understood, you know, uh, not the politics or, what have you, even though, you know, I grew up with, with everything that, that uh, I learned uh, it, when I started getting involved in the Chicano movement. And when I got to California and I lived in California, uh, I started mm -hmm. hearing more about the injustices, you know, 
And in, in our education, I had not really paid attention. You know, I just assumed that that's the way the norm was. In other words, we're Ekan also, we gotta get used to the education or the lack of education or the unequal education that we were getting. Like, I didn't really even understand that I went to a segregated school uh, in San Antonio, in Edgewood, when I started school. Uh, I realized until not too long ago, a few years ago, that Edgewood, that school that I went to, was actually a segregated school because they segregated based on if you knew if you spoke English or not. Uh, and this is something that was illegal, uh, but this is the way that they were getting away way after the, the Mendel versus Wisdom Minister that happened in California on uh, no, no discrimination. But uh, they kept students that didn't speak Spanish no test or whatever. If you, they test you. If you spoke English, they would let you go to the first grade. If you didn't speak English, you went to pre, what they call uh, pre primer or pre primer. That, that's what it was. Pre primer basically was to get all the kids that didn't speak English, or even if you spoke a little bit, but if you didn't communicate, I guess, good enough for them, they would put you in a remedial year. So, I started school, like I said, first grade in, when I was seven years old. Because when I was six, going on seven, I was introduced to pre primer in Edgewood Independent School District. And a few years ago, then I started looking at it. And I said, wow, that was introduced, you know, in 1952, was pre primer introduced in San Antonio. And I started school in 1953. We would go to school half a day uh, to learn English, <laughs> basically. And I already knew how to read in Spanish. I already knew how to write in Spanish. I could translate certain things to the teacher. But uh, because I didn't speak good English, like most of the kids in the barrio, you know, so we were held back. So like I said, my education into the political process of, of growing up, you know, was more with the teatro. And uh, I see Luis Valdez as being very influential because he was the, not so much the first teatro, but the, First teatro that was political, the first teatro that, that was, you know, working to organize, especially at the time, that, uh, mm -hmm. the farm workers. Uh, then, you know, a little more professional, but at, at the same time, with, with uh, I give credit to, uh, what this guy, uh, with uh, a kids show. Uh, Sesame Street. Uh, Sesame Street, yeah, what's was the name, uh, Emilio Delgado. Uh, yeah, yeah. Emilio, <coughs> he was the first Chicano on, on, on Sesame yeah. Street. And Milo was uh, one of my teachers. He was uh, at a church there in, in East Los Angeles. And then we used to rehearse under the Mexican-American. I can't even remember the term, that he, you know, the name of the group. Mm -hmm. But he, was, he had a TV show there in Los Angeles, a kids show. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, he was an actor, he was, you know, doing commercials. He was already involved in, in acting. Mm -hmm. He was called uh, in 70 to go work in New York with uh, Sesame Street. So I remember when he told us when he was going. He went to New York and I came to San Antonio. Was it, so, wait, yeah. so was it, so was it he and, for instance, Luis Valdez that, because both of them were involved. I mean, although Luis Valdez began with teatro, he ended up making films and right. um, and translating those those performances to, to film. Mm -hmm. Were those examples influential to you in the, in that sense? Then of, of kind of well, moving from teatro to cinema. Well, that that moving from, from teatro was was uh, was more see because he wasn't doing cinema. No, no, there was really no Chicano doing cinema, and that's what to me that I didn't understand why. When I was in California, I was trying to be an actor. Uh, and that's what I met when I went to school and I, I became uh, uh, a student with uh, uh, Ricardo Montalban, who had a like a school, a theater art kind of school there in one of the studios in, in Hollywood. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, you know, the, those are the, the, the I thought he, I even asked him, why don't you make a Chicano movie? And, you know, he said, whoa, no, 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 you know, it's too, too involved. And, 
You know, you got to worry about the Screen Actors Guild and you got to worry about all these kind of things, which I didn't even know about unions or I didn't know anything about that. Right. So, I, you know, I just didn't understand well, he's such a famous guy and he, everybody knows him in California. So. And then when I met, uh, he went to visit us at uh, ELAC. Uh, the other, uh, Anthony Quinn, he was doing a TV show called uh, Something in the Man or something, a uh, TV show that came out in the science, it only lasted one year. Mm-hmm. But uh, Anthony Quinn did that TV show and he talked to us. And I asked him the same thing, you know, why don't you do a Chicano movie? Because they, they were, the term Chicano was not used publicly here uh, in the media at all. Mm. Uh, but in California, it was already, you know, what's his name? Uh, uh, Ricardo Montalban was, you know, and there was already talk in 1970 when I was out there, Chicano uh, being, uh, 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 I don't know, a group, a political, uh, uh, something that, that was growing and something that they were not shying away from using. Well, in Texas, even if you said Chicano, they would automatically change it to Mexican-American. Mm. Uh, they would not use the term Chicano in, in the Express News, the Light, or most of the newspapers would deliberately not use the, the term Chicano. It was, to them, a radical and offensive word. So, you know, most of the, the things, like I said, I, I got was uh, from uh, California and Luis Valdez. I asked him the same thing to Luis Valdez when I met him. You know, I thought he was the most talented, you know, individual I'd met at that time. In 72 was when I met, I met in 71, but when they performed with Teatro Nacional de Aztlán in, in Costa Mesa in 72. So in 72, I asked Luis Valdez the same thing. And same thing, you know, after I invested in the dance. Uh, so when I came to San Antonio and then with uh, Chavino, we started talking, we had the same ideas, kind of the same anger about lack of films and what have you, you know, our backgrounds, similar, uh, and our education, you know, we, we realized, you know, we were not, we had been left out, you know, we were yeah. uh, way behind in our education. And I noticed that when I went to California, that Texas yeah. was like about, you know, and at that time, you know, in other words, a high school, like the that I graduated from, like we were like 20 years behind when I went to, to, to California and saw the high schools there where my cousins went and everything. I mean, it was just kind of mind blowing. I, I couldn't believe it, you know, the, the difference from state to state. I mean, probably uh, maybe some better districts in Texas, but I didn't go to them. You know, I remember going from my district. To... So we have a lot of interest uh, from the audience in terms of uh, the, the film and some of the issues related to that. I wonder if we can uh, re- return uh, to San Antonio. Uh, you hooked up with Sabino and uh, you were involved in a Teatro. Can you just tell us a little bit about the process by which you went from Teatro to actually uh, starting the process of making a film, which I think took you almost four years uh, right. brought it out. Yeah, well, when we started doing the theater, I thought it would be kind of easy to, to, to switch over or easier. Because see, one of the problems that we had with the theater is that uh, I had like about 40 kids when I had the Chicano Art Theater. I see kids with most of the high school and I, had, I was a little bit older than them. But uh, I had about 40 kids that would participate with me in San Antonio when we did like a play at the high school or, mm-hmm. or when we opened the, the Guadalupe, we were the first ones to perform at the Guadalupe Theater without that. I mean, uh, when we came the Cine Festival. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we, we, I remember we would go to Colegio, we started going to perform uh, in Colegios. And when I met Sabino, you know, I just started getting tired because, I mean, trying to have control, and, and I was almost, you know, cheap. my girlfriend and I were about the same, a little bit older than him, but we were the chaperones, and we're trying to control uh, and 17, 16, 17, 18 year old kids. Uh, and then when we would go perform, like we went 40 from here in a play, and then we would perform in California, and only 12 people or eight of us, nine all together perform. So we had to change everything around. And then when we went to, 
the colegios back here, and we went to Purdue, and we went to Michigan State, and we went started going to the different universities as a teatro. Uh, I mean, it, it was getting to be such a hassle that that's when Sabino and I said, well, you know, Sabino, why don't we film it? And like, <laughs> forget about all these actors and all these headaches and all these problems of picking all these kids and, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, at that time, we didn't make any money. We had to pass the hat. And, you know, uh, I remember when we went to Michigan on one of our tours, after we went to Purdue, to Michigan State, we performed in Auburn, Indiana, Woodburn, I mean, uh, Defiance, Ohio, all over out there in 1972. And actually, we, we ran out of money and everything. Uh, they gave us like food vouchers and stuff. Uh, we went to work like half a day picking cherries. I took the theater kids to pick cherries. They were lousy. They, you know, and, <laughs> and I said, you all would have starved if you would have been, in, you know, back when I was a backer worker. But the guy gave us, you know, I don't know, we got food steps or whatever they gave us at the time, vouchers, and that's how we got back to San Antonio. Wow. Uh, but, it, you know, uh, so, it, it, you know, it was getting pretty difficult to, to yeah. perform. So we started thinking about, you know, why don't we do a movie? Mm-hmm. And we tried to contact people that I knew, but we didn't know too many people back then that, that were doing that. Right. So I heard that Trinity University had a, a film department. So I, at the time, I figured from different people, you know, you needed so much money and you needed this. And so I had already collected about three, four thousand, three thousand dollars that I had stash or something like that already. So I just walked into the, went to, to Trinity University, looked at the theater department, knocked them, and I said I wanted to speak to, at the name was uh, uh, Hayes, Bill Hayes. I said, I'd like to be with the uh, director of the The lady didn't even want to let me in, the secretary. So I told her what it was about. He was busy. But he must have heard or something, but he came up to the front of the, of the office and said, he told me to come in and sit down. Uh, what was it about? So I told him, look, want to do a movie? <laughs> we have a, we'll, we'll provide the script. Uh, we'll provide the actors, but we don't know how to film it. We have no... Uh, provide the, the cameras and the technician and he said, yeah. So he understood, okay, we'll be the production crew and uh, you'll be get the actors and yeah. And y'all are going to pay for it. Yeah. How much is it? He said, well, we'll do it for $24,000, you know, the, the production in 16 millimeter film. I said, okay. And I said, well, how do we work that? Because I knew I didn't have $24,000. Well, right, uh, the way we would do it is like, he gave us $8,000 up front, and then we'll film the film. And then when we finish, you know, you get another $8,000, that'll be sixteen. dollars And then when we edit it and finish the whole thing and we give you the a release print, then you give us the other $8,000, so that's $24,000. Hmm. So I said, oh, shit, you know, I ain't never going to do that. So I just went, uh, I was going to leave. I said, okay, well, let me think about it. So I started walking out. Just before I opened the door to leave, I had this thinking room that he told me, Frank. And I said, Yes, sir, turn around because you really want to do this, don't you? I said, Sir, I don't know how, but yeah, I want to do this. We're going to do it. He says, Well, come here, sit down. He says, You look, I could get you a scholarship for, to take film classes and mm-hmm. work here at, at the university. I'm the director of the film department. I could probably arrangers you know, a year ago. And I'm going, but that would take me like what? Three, four years to get a degree to, you know, that's the way I figured it. It takes four years to get a degree and then you're gonna get a degree. Then you start making the movies and I said, no, that's too long. I can't wait that long. He goes, you really wanna do I said, no, I, I said, hold on. And then he said, I'm gonna introduce you to uh, the student instructor named Jack Landman. Mm-hmm. So, so, a real nice, super nice guy. I met Jack. Jack comes in and he tells briefly what I'm trying to do. Is it Jack? If I doesn't understand much about the film process, so he, I'm going to let him audit some of your classes. So, I took, started auditing some classes because he was teaching film, Jack. And then uh, we wanted to film. So, I also, around this time, we already had the Chicano Theater with Sabino, with the director. And this guy came in from, uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota, 
uh, I think he was from New York, but he was with St. Paul, Minnesota, with the American Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. And he was visiting the culture in San Antonio, whatever, with a group that would meet, come see the virus or whatever. So they ran into the, the theater, the Chicago Art Theater. We had an office almost downtown at the time, our theater hangout. And they met Savino, and they, you know, Savino told me, oh, Farin wants to do this. Uh, so then he took him over to me, and we talked about it, and I said, well, he said, what do you need? And I said, well, uh, we want to film, but we need a camera. <laughs> and because Jack told me, you need to get a camera, a 16 millimeter camera, okay. So I says, well, how much does the camera cost? So Jack had told me, you know, there's a big camera in Memphis, Tennessee for $10,000. I said, well, they're selling a camera for $2,000. Is that the, yeah, that's the camera. It was an Aeroflex, 16 millimeter Aeroflex. This is at the top of the line. It was, it was a used camera for $10,000. So Jack told me, hey, that's a good camera. You need, that's what you need to buy. So the guy said, you know what? Well, come and apply for a grant. Uh, sure. So we got a ticket and I got dressed up and took off and went to St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. Uh, and had a meeting, they told him, oh, we're going to make a movie. And they said, okay, well, what they had asked for us for me to show a, a clip of the film. And the first clip is that is that scene in the pool, in the pool scene that's in the movie. Mm -hmm. That one was actually shot by Trinity University, Jack Landman and, and Smith. Oh, wow. Yeah, they were, they were all college students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I love them because we were completely different. They were... They were all very wealthy kids, in other words, they, Trinity's a very, you know, the, yeah. uh, here, in San Antonio, like the Harvard or whatever, in San Antonio, very expensive, and very wealthy people go there, so, and mostly white, you know, so, and we were all here, all Mexicanos, but, you know, they, they liked what we were doing, and I couldn't handle, anyway, once we started, uh, I'll make it back, anyway, they gave us, eventually, they, they gave us a grant, and we got $10,000 and we bought the camera. But we didn't know how to load up the camera. We didn't know anything about filmmaking. So we would try to film ourselves. The first scene we tried to film, we had to shoot it three times. One came out blurred, second time, or the first time the sound, the second time blurred. We just three shots to get one simple scene in. And we had to call Jack like three times to load up the, when you load it in a changing bag, you know, black changing bag, and you gotta do it in there without looking at it. <laughs> I mean, we're learning all this, you know, like I talk about on the job training. So Jack became my, like my right hand because every time something happened, I would call Jack and he always, he never let me down. Jack would say, all right, if I go over there and he'd bring his friends over. And they started inviting me to their parties and, you know, we'd hang out over at Trinity. And, uh, you know, they became pretty, pretty cool people. I was what happened was that Bill Hayes opened up, I could get a camera. You know, I, before I got the camera, I could use Trinity's camera. But I was waiting for him to film, big shorts and shorts. We actually started filming with equipment from Trinity. Okay. And then the editing, we used Trinity's editing. And the only thing that, that uh, Bill Hayes asked for was that I had to have students with me. I could check out a camera. I could check out the editing table. Uh, but I could only do it if there was a student like Jack or, or Smith or uh, William uh, Butt. Uh, there were different people. And William Buddy, the nephew or grandson of the HEB stores here. So I'm telling you, I was hanging out with all these people, you know, that they were, uh, you know, Session, William Session's son, you know, uh, all this. I didn't know. All I knew, I just wanted to. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, and they were helping me out. So they were cool people. So that's how I started, you know. So we actually used their equipment to, to, to get ourselves started. And then a lot of help from Jack and the students there, and they helped me edit. And we edited the film of Trinity. We, so, so that's how the whole you know yeah. it took a long time to, to film. Right? And uh, and I'm I'm noticing that uh, we're going to be limited in time, and so I wonder if we can spend a little bit of time, you know, five or ten minutes talking about uh, the release of the film, and then I'd like to make sure we have some time to talk about. The film itself and some of the issues it raises because we have a lot of interest from the folks that just saw it. Mm. We can leave ourselves about five minutes at the end uh, because people are interested in what you think about what's happening now and I know that could go on all night. <laughs> uh, <but laughs> there's a lot to, there's a lot to comment on. 
But I wonder if we can jump ahead to, you've completed the film. Uh, we have a pretty clear sense of, of the way in which you're able to uh, move things forward and make them happen. But you've got a finished film, you've got a, 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 a release print, and you're ready to show it. Uh, so do you call up Warner Brothers, or how, how do you actually? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, to tell the truth, we didn't know, see, because again, going back, we started thinking of doing a film more for the university because we thought instead of taking the kids, we show up, we show a little new film about something related to the Chicano movement or whatever, you know, we yeah. didn't want to do that. So our goal was initially was to go to the universities and, you know, that's how we thought we were going to run it through. Yeah. We had a lot of interest in the Chicano uh, theater to perform, so we said, well, maybe we can do this. So, but when we finished the film, you know, a lot of people got excited with it and started telling me, well, this is good, man. Yeah. 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 Saying, saying it was nice, but, you know. So, and I know anything, the first person that I reached out to is here in San Antonio, uh, Eloy Centeno, who had uh, two or three Mexican theaters yeah. in San Antonio. So I go to, to uh, cause, you know, my father knew his father, you know, you know not that they were right back then, but because they owned the store, and that's where my father used to shop, you know, groceries and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I go to Eloy Centeno and uh, tell him, you know, Mr. Centeno, you know, we got a movie that we want to show. Uh, you know, how can we show, arrange to show it in your theater? And he goes, you know, well, what do you expect? I mean, what's the movie about? I said, well, it's a movie that we shot here in San Antonio, blah, blah. He said, well, who's the stars? You know, like, back then he was like, <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, that's me and my daughter and my brother. <laughs> well, basically, he's kind of a joke. But said, well, you know, it goes up. Uh, you know, man. Local people, you know, there's no no movie stars in it. Okay. I, said, uh, I said, well, I said, well, well look, give me ten percent, and you keep ninety percent. But they said fifty fifty. I said, I'll settle for ten just to show it. So he said, no, he wasn't interested in it. I said, okay. So then we we had a screening, and we sold out the screening at the uh, Holy Family Church. We rented a, a church hall, and but even with a lot of relatives and some friends. So, but we made about 5,000 in one screening and wow. But we still didn't know what to do with it because uh, it was just within a San Antonio and very few people. So that's when Jack told me, Jack again comes in and said, Nefrey, well, have you thought about four walling? I didn't know what four walling was. You explained to me, well, you can rent a theater and you rent it and then everything that goes through there basically is yours. You just pay one price and, oh, okay. So I went in and contacted uh, the theaters here, and I looked at the new theater that opened up, Century South in the South Side. So I said, you know, it's a lot of Rasa over there. So I went to <laughs> Mr. Uh, I can't remember the name of the guy, Santicos, John Santicos. Mm -hmm. They owned like 80% of the screens in San Antonio at the time. So <laughs> I got to Santicos, and he didn't really care about what it was about or anything. He just told me, well, okay, you know, it'll cost you. 4000 for one week, 3000 for the second, 2000 you know, kind of a sliding scale. If you want to take it like that, you got to pay 500 for advertisement for the newspaper. You know, like, okay, I go, oh, you know. I said, well, how do we do this? He said, well, if I, you have to give me like a check for 4000 uh, like a week before, you know, we signed the contract. So the week before the day, I said, okay. And at this time, there's no advertisement, there's nothing, like much a million. So <clears throat> now we got to go up and do our own publicity. So I go to a radio station, they turn me down. I go to another radio station uh, that was on a Chicano station, uh, KDA. And the man offered me a line of credit. Once I got the first line of credit, like I would go like, well, I got credit over there. Oh, you got credit with Kela. Then I give it to Puka, another radio station. So just a word of mouth, I got, <laughs> Three Spanish radio stations, one English station, and two TV stations in English, and one in Spanish. So altogether, I had like twelve thousand dollars in advertisement before the movie opened, and I had not spent a penny yet. It wow. was all you know that I was going to pay, and I had not paid also for the theater. So I was <laughs> looking at like fifteen something like that thousand dollars, and I have no money. I'm broke. We we had a hard time getting the blow up to the for twenty five thousand blow up for the movie. Uh, from 16 to 25, uh, I mean, to 
35, 35 millimeters. So when we we showed it, and the thing that Santico laughed to me in this is because I, I avoided him because I didn't want to give him the check. And <laughs> I gave the check, but the check, there was no money in the bank. So I gave him a, literally a hot check. I prayed that he would <laughs> check it in, and you know, maybe you know, he would bounce after the performance. But anyway, later on, Santico told me that he, he, he kind of figured that you know, what I was doing and that I didn't have any money, but you know, he didn't mind. And it worked out. I mean, as soon as the movie opened up, he wanted to, let's go partner, let's go 50 50. And I said, no, no, you got me on the sliding scale, you know. Uh, I think we made like 90,000, you know, in, in, in from that uh, thing wow. we were there. You, so you, uh, you, you work this kind of pyramid scheme, and you open it. Uh, I can't. It's a weekend day, but you open it as a two o'clock screening. No, twelve. It was a twelve o'clock screening. Twelve o'clock screening, which usually doesn't get many folks. And so you go home to have a few drinks because you get the feeling your legs are going to be broken, right? Well, uh, so what, what happened then? And, and what well, did you? The manager told me, if I, you know, like if the movie's going to make any money, it's going to be. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I mean, you're not going to make nothing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know, the it. So if you're going to make any money, it's going to be those three days. Mm -hmm. So on Thursday, when we premiered it on Thursday, we had lights and everything, and we sold out twice. But again, I saw a lot of people, you know, in the film. I saw people, you know, family, what have you. So that made me feel good that we made like about 10000 or something the first night. But... Now, how is he going to run on the weekend? That was my part, the scary part. So I didn't want to know anything. So I just went home and I didn't drink much, but I got a bottle of scotch. And I, told, I had a secretary at the time and my wife, and I told you, I don't want to know anything until Monday. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Monday when I'm just, if I don't make any money, I'm just literally going to say, okay, lock me up because I ain't got a penny to pay any of you. So uh, that's, you know, I was scared that if that it happened, Monday I was going to have to pay the music. So I didn't want to talk to anybody, but when, you, when it started Friday at 12, it opened. I found out later that at 12, like like over 50 people for the first crowd showing. At uh, 2 o'clock, over two hours, at the 2 o'clock, they had almost 200 people. At the 4 o'clock, it sold out. And by the time I got there, when I got there, they showed me the 6 o'clock was going on and it was already a line outside. So it was just yeah. selling out one after the other. So, I mean, but I didn't want to go. They kept calling me to go to the theater. And I said, hell no, I'm not going to go. So I said, I'm not going to go. And so the manager kind of made it like, no, something went wrong with the film. You know, made like an emergency. I had to go to the theater. So I left around a little bit after six, right around six to go to the theater. And I was, I didn't even want to go. I was driving a little old car, you know. I felt really bad. I said, oh, man. <laughs> Now, you know, problems, you know, you're just starting to already have problems. But when I was parking the parking lot, the parking lot's packed. But then there was the, uh, all the presence man and other movies were going on. So I said, well, makes sense. So I'm walking very, dis <laughs> you know, quite disheartened, you know, now I'm trying to get to this. But then as I started getting closer, I see the line and the long line outside. And we're going around the building and go, I get closer, I see that most of them are Chicanos and Morenos. I go, could it be? And I started running those last yards. I was running. And sure enough, I saw it. They're all in line to my poster right there. Please don't bury me alive. And all these people in line. So I asked the man, yeah. what happened? He said, no, I just wanted you to see. He said, yeah. get to me, you weren't going to come. Look at this. Look at the people. They were all having a good time. And they sold out. But next to you got a major hit on your hands. I said, really? Yeah. And sure enough, you know, from there, some people took it after we made a deal. They took it to the theater downtown, took it to the varsity where I grew up, the theater driving that I grew up going to, and they took it to the Century Twins. Uh, yeah. And about 40 theater uh, drive-ins. And, and then from there, just people started calling, and we started, you know, like after that, we went to Del Rio, and then after Del Rio, we went to El Paso, and then we came back, and then we went to Laredo. Then we went to Brownsville. And we were just going wherever people were calling yeah. us. We were exhausted. So that's yeah. why Mexico came in and took advantage of us because, yeah. you know, we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> so we've, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, and I just want to point out that the, the uh, your papers, your, your archival papers are at Stanford University. And these include a lot of the business contracts and everything that you huh. work with theaters. 
Uh, your films are archived here at UCLA. And a few years ago, uh, you know, this film entered the National Film Registry as part of the American cinema heritage. Um, and really, you know, it, it's much deserved and it really speaks to a very unique kind of cinema, uh, which is, I think, particularly noted by it really being a thoroughly bilingual film. And at the time, uh, the other Chicano filmmakers that were beginning to do stuff, and they still do it today, you'll have a parent speaking in Spanish and the child translates it and then answers, right? Um, which is not very natural. Uh, did you ever consider anything like that? Or was you, were you just doing a film that was just taking as a, for basically, we're gonna be ourselves? Uh, that is the that's what, you know, Savino, Savino was more grounded and more political than I was. You know, Savino was, to me, like a people, I mean, he was a beautiful person. And, uh, you know, my right hand, we, we, like we were partners, we, he respected what I wanted. And, uh, you know, that's the way we spoke. So he and I more or less agreed uh, because a lot of people came in and, and when we were starting to do it, like wanted to know, well, are you going to do it in English or are you going to do it in Spanish? Or are you going to, like you said, translate? Or are you going to... So even Chista, when I met Chista already, and Chista was like, well, why, you know, why do you want to change it? Do it, you know, like Tex-Mex, you know, kind of what was known, you know, slang for, for our language. So I said, yeah, just do it the way, you know, lo como hablamos. And it's true, you know, like... Uh, I, I yeah. to my father in Espanol, you know, my daughter in English, you know, my friends in English and Spanish, combination, depends on who can pass a land, you know, so it's, it's, we grew up that way. It strikes me that uh, people going to the film were seeing a film in which the people on the screen talk like them. Yeah. And one thing I always find very fascinating about your films, because so many of it are shot in, in, in actual locations, they also had a good chance of seeing themselves on the film, on the screen. Yeah. I, mean, I, know, I know Colin, because he's got all these records behind him. He, I think he wants to follow up about the music. Yeah, but, and I, I wanted to, I also, I, 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 the, the Steve Jordan album with uh, Run, Te Gato, Run, that song in it is always slipping through my grasp. I'm always looking for that. <laughs> I love that song. That, that's your second film. But, also, I, but, but um, I've always been interested in, in the use of music in your film as someone who uh, loves Tejano music and, and the way that it almost seems, I, I guess, organic or or documentary like so it's not it, it's not say a soundtrack laid on top it is but it also seems like a language to come from the environment yeah i mean if you if you really understand spanish and, and you listen to the to the music that you see in the background you know he's laying what's going on or it's going to tell you what's happening or the reason that is there in other words the the music to me uh i could have started editing or learning to edit and Jack, you know, was also introduced me to being able to to set a tone with, with the music that we want to set and express, you know, ourselves. I mean, I wish I had used some other music that you know they would have also be fine. But uh, we were going at the time. I was going with the musicals that I knew that were in the Tejano, the Chicano music, you know, that that we wanted. Like in this first movie, we had more of the conjunto kind of musica. With the Steve Jordan in, in Rantecato, we had a little more of the uh, West Side, you know, kind of sound with conjunto. And then in, in the last movie that I made, for anybody who's seen it, is uh, No or one of No Rider uh, Spring Break in San Quilmas, which is No Rider Weekend. Anyway, on that one, you know, we we tend to show more of the blues sound, more of the uh, what we call the West Side sound in San Antonio, but. Uh, all this music is the music that I grew up with. You know, we grew up with a mixture of English and Spanish. And when it was Spanish, it was conjunto. And as we grew up, the, the Chicano music was orquesta, uh, Tejano, it became Tejano. Uh, but we really, we dubbed it Chicano before it was, you know, like a lot of the Latin breed, the Royal Jesters, a lot of the older group, yeah. Sunny and the Sangos, all these older bands, you know, that are known in the West Coast because they're more, uh, uh, slow, you know, low lighter kind of like low lighter music. music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, that that's part. That's the West Side Sound in San Antonio. And mm -hmm. but uh, so I, I used it like more chicanos para siempre to me. Now that one, 
you know, it's not, it's the one that, you know, he had a lot of problems, and I think, but that one, the music, uh, if you just listen to the music that Henry Padarama from La Patria plays on it and comes out in that movie, I mean, the music will tell you the story. Uh, every song that comes on with what's going on or what's happening in the movie, it's telling the story just like a ballad, like a corrido, and you've got like about six different songs that will come in into what she goes by a simple and tell the story. Uh, and here, I was just learning in the first one, so, you know, now I wish I had, you know, more time to do more things, but I don't apologize now or anything, but uh, I, I would just want people to understand that we did it with no money, uh, no understanding really of what we were doing. We would ask somebody and then we would go do it. It's like if I'm asking, you know, okay, uh, how do you open up uh, a, a camera so I, you know, to load it yeah. up or something like that? You show me and then I would go do it or something like that. You know? So we got about three minutes and I, I want to ask you a quick question from the audience and Colin will end with uh, the last question from uh, the audience. But uh, can you just say a little bit about, you know, you're, you're playing the main character. You wrote this. You're the director. Um, but the main character is, he's, he's not, he's, he's an anti-hero. He's not really all good. He's not all bad. He's a very mixed figure. He's, he's, he's sexist. He's racist. He's got vision. Uh, can you say a little bit about that choice? Uh, about, yeah. It's why like, to pick somebody that's, that's that, that mixed like that. Well, we wanted to, to be able to cover what was actually going on at the time. And what, what we're talking about, aside, you know, like when we talk about education, remember, we, you know, I, I talk bad about education in the film. You know, I cut down, like, I mean, we feel like, oh, you call the teacher this or that. Chicken, yeah, you, you know. Anyway, so what I'm saying is we weren't happy with it when we were educated. And so when we graduated, Alex and I went to school, the guy that I based the story on, it's like mm -hmm. a combination of myself and a combination of of Alex Ayala, my, my best friend in high school, who went, who actually went to prison and who was doing drugs and stealing and doing, you know, he, that's, that, that was Alex. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a little bit more like Sabino, the guy that played the, the, the teatro, because I, I started getting, what saved me was I give a lot of credit with the Chicano movement, getting involved in the teatro, getting, because if I would have stayed with Alex, I probably would have ended up in, in prison also with him. But see, uh, <clears throat> when we were growing up, uh, there were really no opportunities for employment in San Antonio in the 60s. I mean, in the 60s, Vietnam was going on. You know, the opportunity was to go to the army, you know. And mm -hmm. if you were lucky enough, you know, you could get a job as a policeman. And this was the kind of job that were available to us. In other words, we didn't have uh, college automatic that we were going to go to. Most of us were not going to college. So when, when all this is going on, and then... The, the machismo that was going on, you know, yeah. the, the drug scene that was starting to open up, the, the, the liberalism that, that, that was happening, you know, that uh, we grew up going to high school in the 60s and then, you know, the civil rights movement, you know, bang, hits us in 66, 67, you know, that we start seeing it actually, you know, around us. So when you see all these things, and Alex was more of a, uh, you know, he was a playboy kind of, you know, he wasn't, really uh, involved in, in, in the, the, the movimiento. Actually, he was uh, came from uh, divorced parents. He, you know, there was issues in, 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 yeah. in his upbringing. So when you, when you see this, it was just like we were lost between the late 60s, the beginning of the 70s. We were confused. We were lost. I remember we were waiting, we were going to sign up, three of us to go sign up in the service in 1967, around that time. And only David, the better sign up, Alex and I. But what, what I'm getting at, we were kind of confused trying to understand what's going on in the world, what's going on with us. And then we, uh, you know, he got married about the same time. He had a child around the same time. So, you know, like between 66, 67, 68, 69, you know, those years were very confusing to, to yeah. for not only me, for a lot of cute, uh, young men. Yeah. That time. You're, you're really trying to capture that moment and all of its uh, contradictions, ambiguity, uh, not not tell a morality tale, but really show the way things are, how people spoke, what they listened to, right? Yeah, like, like I tell people, it wasn't, like I said, we weren't trying, 
we just want to be treated the same. And like I said, yeah. we weren't. You know, like Alex should have bought, she had gotten yeah. probation, it was his first major offense, whatever. And I saw cases where it was similar to that. Yeah. So, and, you know, we had a very, uh, Judge Woods, you know, was one of the most racist judges that we had yeah. found in San Antonio. So when you look at all this, you know, yeah. there was just so, something that, 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 uh, the yeah. system was just getting flooded. The, the prison system is also happened with the with, uh, uh, heroin, right? Well, with the heroin, but, but I'm getting, when you're getting arrested, you, the conspiracy theory is what's happening. The conspiracy was not, I think it came in in 71, uh, uh, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Before the conspiracy theory, they would take, let's say, they arrested three or four and busted. They would take the guy that was holding the gun or whatever. Yeah. And like, once it was a conspiracy theory, then they would come and they would take three or four of you just because you have to be with the same okay. person like you knew about it. So the conspiracy, you know, they, whenever they hit somebody, anybody that knew about it was yeah. heard about it because yeah. they're going to They're going to they're they're gonna gonna NLA too. We're going to have to wrap it up. So uh, I want to leave Colin with the last question and, and we need to have like a, a Twitter level response uh, to kind of size up uh, the current moment. Colin, uh, take it away. Yeah, there are two things. I, I, if you look at the current landscape, I mean, you, you talk about um, uh, the lack of representation, the lack of images of Latinos, um, and that being part of your motivation for doing this, the fact that no one was making Chicano cinema and asking everyone why no one is. Um, so I guess it's a, kind of a two-part related question. What is? I think you get one part. <laughs> one part. So how do, you see the, how do you see that situation today, and what advice would you have for a young Chicano Latino filmmaker um, who, who who wants to make their own cinema? Who wants to? Down to the last minute for the cut us off. Well, uh, what, I, what I think is that a lot of Chicanos are missing out. You know, everybody's trying to be uh, Hollywood. Everybody's trying to be, which I guess that's where the money is. But you know, there's so many stories that have not been told that are way yeah. more you know interesting yeah. that, that need to be you know. There, somebody was already there to to, to mm -hmm. that'll blow you away. One I tell like uh, I told uh, uh, Christina when I met her, I told her about a book called The Rebel, and that I said that's about two ladies, actually three. If you combine uh, the one from New York, it could be one Anglo lady, one from Mexico, and one from Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and one from Laredo, Texas. And The Rebel, we're talking about uh, Jovita Ida, and we're talking about uh, the uh, Laura Villegas de Magnon, and mm -hmm. they started the White Cross that you know, helped uh, Mexico. They were the two most influential women that, that got involved in Mexico. Jovita that fought the Texas Rangers. I'm not allowing it to go. Jovita that's opened schools. I mean, you know, and, and you know, like, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's a picture of, of uh, La, La Villegas de Magron walking into Mexico City when Carranza first took over Mexico City and she's riding on a horse. And this is a woman in, in you know, during the revolution and, you know, and it's a beautiful book. I always recommend it. The Rebel, La Rebelde. And it's mm -hmm. about Diego de Magnon, but it tells a little bit of the story of Jovita uh, Hidal, uh, my one of my all time favorite Chicana. Well, I, will, I, will, I would also add that your story would make a great film if, I, if, any, if there's <laughs> filmmakers out there that would like a, a story I, that, that needs to be told. I, I, I would, you know, I've had to be for everything, but I guess it means I'm not going to be around, but I'm trying to put it much of the doubt when certain things. My wife, my kids, hopefully, will put something together. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, that will be interesting. I think that uh, yeah. I won't be around to see it, but uh, I hope they do. Well, it. let's let's <laughs> hope people are here, but uh, we're not going to be around much longer on this uh, show. I want to thank everybody uh, for, for yeah. sticking with us. Let your friends know uh, that both this discussion and the film are available for the next week. The discussion will continue. Colin, thank you so much, and. A wonderful introduction, and it's nice to see you again. And, and, and you too, Efrain. Uh, you nice see you. You really are a national treasure, and you've really brought very unique stories into being uh, through cinema. And I really appreciate you being a role model, but also directly encouraging people to go out there and find the different stories, not the ones Hollywood you think right. Hollywood wants to do. So, thank you. So, thank you all, and thank you for the audience that's out there. And, Oh, <laughs> <laughs>